before I even start, I just want to make a comment about uh, something that David just said, which is uh, very apropos. Uh, he, he said about the importance of sharing your ideas. Um, I was once having this conversation with um, uh, a, a very great scientist, one of the founding fathers of my field. And someone else had just published a paper on an idea that I knew to be his, and he wasn't a co-author on that paper. And uh, so I said to him, uh, Russell, isn't this your idea? Aren't you upset about this? And he said, you know, you get credit for some you don't deserve. You don't get credit for some you deserve. In the end, it averages out. And I think, you know, I, he was absolutely right about that. And, you know, he is known for being, you know, an absolute genius. But, you know, the reason we celebrate him is because he's a nice person. So, um, so I have some remarks here. They are... Uh, they contain absolutely nothing that has not been said, uh, but perhaps I can, uh, you can uh, think of them as a summary of things that have been said. So I was asked to come here today to talk about failure. Within that topic, the speakers were given carte blanche, and I intend to fully make use of that freedom by sharing you with what are undoubtedly some random scattered thoughts. Before I start, however, let me state clear that you'll, what you'll hear from me are mere opinions and personal thoughts, which should really be preempted by all manners of caveats and qualifiers. Not wishing to dwell too long on that, let me just say that the context to which my remarks belong is the academic world, pretty much the only world that I know, and that in itself is a failure. And though some of the things that I'll say can perhaps be generalized beyond that, I advise caution uh, in the extrapolation. So the title of my talk is On Failure, uh, though it could equally well and just as accurately have been called In Praise of Failure for reasons that will soon be clear. I suppose failure is a subject on which I am about as well versed as anyone else. This renders this invitation different from others that I tend to get, which are typically predicated on my being uniquely qualified to discuss a certain subject. It's probably the case that failure is an academic research topic. Um, I mean, almost certainly there are professional people out there who study and theorize about failure. And rightly so, for it is obviously important. But that's not my case. I am simply a practitioner of failure, and in that sense, I suspect, no different from most people. So why am I here? Well, my meriting this podium, to the extent that I do, must therefore stem from how I deal with failure. Perhaps that's indeed an aspect on which I can offer opinions that I hope might go beyond the banal. So let me begin by defining what I understand by the term. In fully circular logic, uh, failure is the inability to reach a certain goal. So the definition of failure inevitably leads us to the definition of goals. These can be very specific. By the end of the weekend, I will have this text written, and I did, by the way. Or they can be quite vague. I wish I were a better scientist. We constantly set goals for ourselves of many different types. Realistic goals, by definition, are tailored specifically to the person who's setting them. For example, it makes a little sense for me to decide that my next goal is going to be to outperform Tom Brady as a quarterback. But it's not foolish for me to think that I could run 10K in under 45 minutes a relatively ambitious but attainable goal for the weekend dabbler that I am. What is not a goal? Well, reversing my definition above and indulging in the circular logic, a non-goal, if you will, is something that you cannot fail at. These, again, are specifically individual. Tying my shoelaces presents no great difficulty for me, but for some people, this can be incredibly challenging. My point is this. If your goals are well adjusted to your potential, the word potential is important here, it follows that you will fail at them a lot. I will have to run many instances of a 10K race to finally break the 45 minute barrier. If you're not failing all the time, you're aiming too low. Our potential has this funny property of not being constant. Over time and in response to both inner and outer stimuli, it expands in some directions and contracts in others. This means that one must constantly gauge its boundaries. And the only way to do that is by stepping outside of them. That is, by failing extensively, constantly. 
So I am naturally led to what is going to be the main point that I wish to communicate. The most important thing is how you deal with failure. Real failure, declaring oneself a failure, is a state of mind. Critically, I think, we must not simply accept failure, but embrace it. For it is only by learning the lessons it teaches us that we will eventually succeed. Or, to put it differently, failure occurs when we learn nothing from not succeeding. Note that by accepting failure, I do not mean to imply that we let ourselves be defeated. One should never surrender. What I mean to say is that acceptance of failure is the only way we will straighten our course. Now, you might legitimately be thinking that it's all too easy and even somewhat flippant to rationalize and discourse loosely about these things from the comfortable viewpoint of a tenured job at MIT. Perhaps that's true. But I am fortunate to tell you, in all honesty, that my ability to feel absolutely gutted when things don't go my way has never been greater. The thing, though, is this. I am yet to live through a failure episode that has not taught me something valuable and that, I insist, is key. Let me put this explicitly in the context of academic research, which is the setting that I am most familiar with. And let me ask you, what do you suppose research is? If you a priori know the answer to a specific problem, it's not research. And if you don't, how else do you arrive at it except by trying wrong things until you finally get it? And if you never get the answer you seek, have you failed? Well, I'd argue that only if you've learned nothing in that process, but that's most unlikely. Indeed, the science folklore abounds with stories of critically important results that were obtained when trying to solve some other question. I realize that you might like me to move beyond what some might call generic platitudes and actually share with you some personal experiences. I will briefly state a few things. They are obvious, but I thought you might le like to hear them anyway. Of course, I have applied for things that I didn't get. Of course, I have been stuck with research questions for long periods of time, even years. Of course, I struggle with maths and physics every day. Am I the perfect advisor? No. Am I a flawless teacher? Most certainly not. But, do I try to be better at these things? Yes. Constantly, relentlessly, tirelessly. And, perhaps I fool myself, but if I do, I do not know it. I will add this. I credit this way of failing every day with leading me to whatever few successes I might have had. I will leave you with one of my favorite quotes. It is from a writer that I hold dear in my heart, Albert Camus, in his essay, The Myth of, the Myth of Sisyphus. Sisyphus is a character from Greek mythology who is condemned by Zeus to push a heavy rocket up a mountain, a very heavy rocket, uh, rock up a mountain, I'm sorry. <laughs> Not a rocket. Uh, knowing full well that it will roll back down and they'll have to do it all over again forever and ever. I leave Sisyphus at the foot of the mountain. One always finds one's burden again. But Sisyphus teaches the higher fidelity that negates the gods and raises rocks. He too concludes all is well. This universe, henceforth without a master, seems to him neither sterile nor futile. Each atom of that stone, each mineral flake of that night-filled mountain, in itself forms a world. The struggle towards the heights is enough to fill a man's heart. One must imagine Sisyphus happy. Thank you. <laughs>